We began with five golden tickets, like five lucky bolts of lightning ready to strike without notice at any point on the map. Hold your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. I got involved with uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory because my daughter, Madeline, who was 10, it's 1970, came to me and said, uh, Daddy, I just read this book. It's a great book, great book. And I said, yeah, what's it about? Oh, a man with a chocolate factory, and I really love it. You ought to make a movie out of it and get Uncle Dave to put up the money for it and get the money some way, but that's what should be done. So I read the book. It was pretty interesting. I went to Dave, who I worked with, and uh, Dave Wolper. And I said, the kid wants us to make this picture, and I think it's pretty good. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a book by Raoul Dahl. And Mel Stewart's daughter mentioned it to him, told him to mention it to me, tell Mr. Walper to sell because it's a good story. And Mel told it to me. And somewhere close to that time, uh, we had some f television shows we were doing for Quaker Oats. And uh, Quaker Oats was going to introduce a new candy bar. And one of the executives there told me about it. I said, well, I, I have a perfect movie to go with that, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It's a book about a chocolate factory. I read it and said, oh, that's, that's terrific. Let's make it. Let's make a movie out of it. And what we'll do is we'll release the movie about the same time the candy bar comes out, and it'll be a great promotion for a new candy bar. Eventually, they decide to call the candy bar a Wonka bar, so we changed the title of the movie to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, because they wanted the, the title of the candy bar in the, in the title. So they put up the money to make the movie. I said, Quaker Oats, that's not a studio, that's a oatmeal company. And he said, well, I convinced them that they should make a Wonka bar and start with a big chocolate thing and they'd make a lot of money from it. They gave us $3 million to make the movie. We had a script by Raoul Dahl and we brought in a, another writer who was working on a lot of Walper shows called David Selsa. I went to Munich and walked into a situation that if it were presented to me today, I wouldn't have done it. It was a big movie, it was a musical. I had never written a screenplay. It was missing, I felt, and Dave felt, Stan Margulies, the producer, felt, a lot of elements that we needed. For instance, if I remember correctly, there was no villain. It didn't have Slugworth. That was an invention by one of us or all of us along the way, that there was this guy whispering in everybody's ear as they went. I don't think I was sure what he was whispering, until I got down toward the end of it. You know, I had to make good on that promise of Slugworth. I'm not sure if that was somebody else's idea or mine. It was all such a, a product of desperation. People have asked, why did I shoot this in Munich? Very simple. I didn't want to shoot it in New York or St. Louis or anywhere in the United States. This was to be a place that was never, never. It was a Neverland that you didn't know where it was. And if you look at the picture, you can't, unless you're very, very clever, you wouldn't know it's Munich. I did that deliberately so that the picture could not be pegged for any time or any place. It's a fantasy. You guys ready? Yeah, you're on. Now, this is it, folks. This is the big day, the historic day on which Willy Wonka has promised to open his gates and shower gifts on the five lucky winners. From all over the globe, people have gathered here, waiting for the hour to strike, waiting to catch a glimpse of that legendary magician, Mr. Willy Wonka. Mel and I were in New York, and uh, in walked Gene Wilder, and Mel said, He's got the part. He didn't even have to open his mouth. I said, He's got the part. I said, I'd like to come out with a cane and be crippled. And I said, because no one will know from that time on whether I'm lying or telling the truth. And he said, you mean if we don't do that, you won't do the part? I said, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying. OK, OK, we'll do it. And, uh, and I meant it, too, because it was a tricky part. But that element of who knows, is he lying or is he telling the truth, was what my main motor was. And, uh, 
and I liked that. It appealed to me a lot. What Jean brought to it was a lovability to a character who was not written lovable, who was written in a frightening way, who was kind of a monstrous boogeyman kind of nightmarish character who was spinning magic that was evil. Kids were disappearing, they were exploding, they were turning blue, they were going down a chute. And you could never really be frightened because there was always that reassuring lovability of Gene Wilder, which I think is uh, his signature, which is his trademark. A brilliant directorial choice in casting him and a brilliant performance. When I read the book, I thought about lying and telling the truth. And in this case, I have a great secret. As Willy Wonka, I'm looking for one particular boy. But the audience doesn't know all that until the end. Grandpa, I don't believe it. We did it. We're actually going in. We're going to see the greatest of them all, Mr. Willy Wonka. They didn't have a script at that point. They came out, and it was in end of May, and I was in the sixth grade. And we just read from the book. We had no script. I just read from the book. Late July was when they called and said, yes, they were interested, came to New York for a screen test. After the screen test, at that point, they were pretty certain that they wanted me to play Charlie. But it was several weeks after that that uh, I was finally told that I had the role. That was early to mid-August, and I think we had about, about 10 days to get ready to pack up and, and move to Munich, Germany for five months. So it was an exciting time. But he was such a sweet, uh, gentle fellow. And then I had to be so cruel to him towards the end of the picture. You know, there's a great temptation to say, now, you know, I'm going to be cruel to you, but I'm, I'm only acting. It's, that's part of the story. You know that, don't you? I really love you. I said, don't do that, because you're going to be robbing him of a chance to be scared and terrified and hurt, betrayed, the actor in him. So I didn't say anything. And they didn't know what I was going to do. But I really let him have it. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You see what was going on in Willy Wonka's mind all this time, trying to find one honest boy who could stand up to all the temptations even the cruelty, but he sticks with his honesty. It's a great tale. Charlie was sort of, in my mind, what we want all our children to be. I don't know if I was really acting, I was just playing myself, and I guess it came somewhat naturally, um, but with Gene and Jack and, and Mel Stewart, to become Charlie was somewhat a natural extension of myself, of, of my personality. Augustus, how does it make you feel to be the first golden ticket finder? Hungry. Any other feelings? Well, there was an advertisement in the newspaper, and uh, my mom, mom responded on that because she thought she had a pretty nice uh, son. And so we go out to Grünwald, that's the place where the film was made, and met Mel, and he looked at me and said, oh, quite okay. Augustus Gloop was just a nice, German boy. He couldn't speak uh, English, but he he looked the part. He was so marvelous, and uh, he was so good-natured when we threw him in the river and <laughs> we put him up in the chute and everything else. And they put a tube with uh, drinks on, on me. I was standing, and the tube was coming down around me. And they filled it up with water, and afterwards I got out of the tube, and they put uh, the chute to pop it up. So the very dangerous scene was not for me. <laughs> Baruka, sweetheart, I'm not a magician. Give me time. I want it now. I had to go for the casting of the hotel, and I remember having to, they didn't even have a script at that point, so there was not even a script to, to read from. And I remember doing all these actions, and he was saying, no, be nastier. This is Mel Stewart, the director. No, you gotta be nastier than that. You gotta be nastier than that. And I was getting really quite grumpy with him. He said, oh, be nastier, be nastier. Like, oh, right, in the end, I'll be really nasty. So maybe I was just the brattiest of them all. I just thought, and will always think, is one of the most, gives one of the most credible performances of, uh, 
of child actors. She, she just was a natural. My demise was going after the, the golden goose that lays the golden eggs, which of course wasn't actually there because it was put in afterwards. We finally got to shoot this sequence on my birthday. It was October the 26th, 1970. And I remember being told, right, you have to stand absolutely in the middle um, because the trapdoor just dropped away like that. So it's just a very strange feeling to just be standing on something that just gives. And you have to stand perfectly in the middle. Don't put your arms out at all, because if you do, you're going to bang on the sides as you go down. And remember not to stand back up again, otherwise you'll hit your head. Violet, would you care to say a few words sure, to the well, nation? Here it is, golden ticket number three, and it's all mine. Tell us how it happened, Violet. I got cast in Willy Wonka. I was living in New York City, and it was, I think I had three callbacks for this, for this role. And I was very excited about getting it because I was able to work with kids and I had been acting all of my childhood and most of the time just been with adults. It was very difficult for her becoming the big blueberry. It was because we put her in this big plastic thing and the, and the, and the Oompa Loompas are rolling her around. The uh, Oompa Loompas did not have their blueberry driver's licenses and they were shorter than I was wide or tall and they would try to roll me, and this was a real metal steel door frame. And of course, I'd get away from them and bang into the door frame. So uh, that, that I think will stay with me forever. Mike, would you tell us this? Wait till I get a real one. Colt 45. Pop won't let me have one yet, will you, Pop? Not till you're 12, son. I was a five year acting veteran by the time I was 11 and cast in Willy Wonka. Um, I went into an audition in New York. It was like most other auditions. Uh, Mel Stewart was there. Paris was perfect in his delivery. He just knew how to be an obnoxious kid better than anybody I've, I've ever seen. Oh, he was a little brat. And uh, if you're watching this, you know that I, I love you now. But you were a troublemaker then. What I remember most about the TV scene was uh, they had a big set of a TV for me to crawl around in. I was walking back and forth on a black platform. Then I have to be picked up. They had a little doll about this big, um, which they cut to after the shot where I'm dangling. So within that 30 seconds or whatever, they employed various different um, special effects techniques to create the illusion. Funny looking people, aren't they, Wonka? What are they doing there? It must be creaming and sugaring time. Well, they can't be real people. Well, of course they're real people. Stuff and nonsense. No, Oompa Loompas. Oompa Loompas. Oompa Loompa Doompa Dee Da. If you're not greedy, you will go far. As the film was being made in Germany, there weren't many, hardly any German actors of the small height. And the only ones they could get, uh, that could speak English, I suppose, or could understand could understand English was from over here in England. Uh, so they got nine nine guys. They already had one German guy called Rudy. Once we decided to get the Oompa Loompas, uh, that was difficult. For some reason, but it's very hard to find midgets and dwarfs who could play the part. We searched around, and many of the people didn't speak English. Oh, I know we got some from Turkey some from Malta, but the communication got a little bit difficult sometimes because the very few of them spoke English. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the chocolate room. When I saw it the first time, I was knocked out. It was really magnificent, but the set was just gorgeous. And we spent a lot of time on that set. When we went in, it was a revelation to go through that door and then see the factory. Kids ask me on the street, and I get them every, every four or five years, I get a new crop. And after they've seen Willy Wonka, I can see walking down the sidewalk, they're staring at me that way. And, and if I stop and talk, they want to know, was that stuff real? Could you really eat it? And I say, about a third of it you could. That was real. The big suckers, those were all real. The other stuff wasn't real. Well, what about that buttercup that you that you took your tea out of and then you ate it at the end? I said, that was wax. I waited till Mel Stewart hollered cut, and then I had to spit it out because I couldn't swallow that stuff. It was just wax. But I started chewing it, and I'd chew it and chew it till he said cut, and then... Harper Goff is one of the great reasons for the success 
of Willy Walker. He had the most incredible imagination. The big Willy Wonka set with the river, it was designed by him, of course, and somehow he got a river in there and the waterfall to work, and the boat had to be designed. I mean, just incredible amount of work that had to be done, and he just designed this fantasy land. If it looks good on film, it was twice as good in person. It was. I remember when they first opened that chocolate room door. That's our actual reaction. We had not seen it and it was phenomenal. First of all, I thought, well, the chocolate is not very deep, about that deep, so how can I jump in or how can I fly in? But there was a big hole on one special site and uh, you can jump in there. I'm sorry it wasn't chocolate at all. It was very uh, dirty cold water and uh, it was very cold. That's the, the big problem to me for these days because I have to jump in a lot of times and it was a very cold day. Well, we're dealing with $2 million. Today, the picture would probably cost $80 million. Everything we had to do, close to the vest, watch the bucks. But we really were a bunch of amateurs flying by the seat of our pants. And I think the, the, I think the film reflects that. It has that kind of energy, that kind of ingenuity. You know it's not, it's not the function of sitting down and intellectualizing. It's not the function of a ton of money. It's the function of scotch tape, cardboard, let's put on a show. And, and I think that's the flavor of what makes the movie so vital and so vibrant. Who can take a sunrise, sprinkle it with dew? When we began to think about the structure of the whole picture, the idea of music came up. I wasn't nuts about putting music in the picture at first. But I began to see with the fantasy, it, it could work if we got the right music. So I thought it might be a good idea. Could we find the right composers? Again, Dave Walper came through. His very good friends were Leslie Burgess and Anthony Newley, who at that time were really hot. We said, give us three or four songs, an Oompa Loompa song and a main theme and a couple of other things. And so they went away and they came back. I'll never forget the day. It was at Dave Walper's house. The candy man with Sammy Davis Jr. turned out to be the big smash of the picture. Anthony Newley, you know, was a good friend of Sammy Davis, played the song from. Newley wanted to play the candy man in the picture, and so did Sammy Davis. They both wanted to play the candy man in the picture. And I said no, because I wanted the picture to be as real. I come from a documentary background. I didn't want it to be showbiz. The music by Tony Newley and Leslie Brickus had been completed before the screenplay was, before Roald Dahl ever arrived on the set. And so they started building the sets and in fact in Munich started filming the musical sequences. They needed dialogue to get into those numbers and get out of those numbers. And I had to write those out of continuity because once they finished the songs, they would break that set and rebuild it for another musical number. On the night I recorded, Anthony Newley came by. He just uh, put his arms around me, gave me a big hug, and said, all the best. And then he left. But he'd come in just to, to do that. And he didn't stick around. He didn't want to make me nervous. So singing, because it's, for actors, it's more difficult to sing than to act. If you want to view paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want to do it, want to change the world, there's nothing to it. The funniest story, I think, is about the ending of the picture, because I left there thinking I had done my job. I left there absolutely exhausted, disheveled, not having slept for weeks, and wandered around in a daze trying to explain this experience I had had. It was like being shot out the other end of a tornado. And I wound up at this little broken down log cabin I still have on a lake in Maine. The last word of Raul Dahl's original script was, Grandpa says yippee. I said, oh my God, I'm going to end this picture with Grandpa Says Yippee? That's impossible. Where's the kid? 
And they said, well, uh, David went home. I said, where did he go home? Well, he went on a vacation in Maine somewhere, and nobody knows where he is. I said, everything's going to stop. I am not going to end the picture with Grandpa saying yippee. I said, find me David Seltzer. I was on my way to go fishing one day up in Maine, and a phone rang. There was only one phone up there. It was a pay phone literally tacked to the trunk of a tree so that anybody around could hear it. It would go all the way across the lake, and it was ringing, and I walked over and picked it up. And it's Germany, and it's Mel Stewart, and he's on the set. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm on vacation. I said, I know you're on vacation, but I'll tell you what. I am here, and there are dozens of people, and we're spending a lot of money, and we can't finish the film, and I want the end line of this picture. He says, well, when do you want it? I said, now. I want it now. Like in the song, I want it now. I want it now. And I thought, well, I will pitch the only thing I can think of, but how pathetic. They all lived happily ever after. So I said to Mel, so what we'll do is they're flying in the air, and Willy Wonka looks at Charlie and says in a very warning voice, Don't forget what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he always wanted. What happened? He lived happily ever after. So I'm standing on the phone, and there's dead silence on the other end. I thought, I am sunk. I said, Mel, are you there? He said, fantastic. And I said, that's it. And I hung up, and I gave Gene the line, and we started to shoot it. It gave me the chills when Mel told me uh, what David had come up with. I thought it was a wonderful ending to the film. I'm a veterinarian in upstate New York. I'm a partner in a mixed animal practice. We do both pets, uh, dogs, cats, but we also do uh, horses. And mainly, I do mainly dairy work. So it's a far cry from the acting world, but uh, it's something I enjoy very much. And, and I'm still involved with children from the aspect of bringing Willy Wonka to the schools. If public schools are interested, then I will go to their schools and speak to them about what I do now as a veterinarian, and, but more importantly, what I have done in the past. And it's important for kids to see that, to see the decisions that adults have made and that what they're doing now, are they happy and successful decisions. Well, I did a two or three side roles in, in German TV films afterwards, but then my father decided I have to do school first. Started a little bit at the university in Munich, and now I'm a tax accountant and a public accountant. I had been working up until I did this. I had just got, gotten off of a two-year stint with Dark Shadows, the soap opera about vampires. And after Willy Wonka, I went on to do several more films, Episodics, Brady Bunch. So I worked for about another eight years, and then uh, I decided that maybe I should get a real job. And so I quit acting and went into the medical field. So, and now I'm an accountant and a mother. When I finished the film, I went back to school. I was back to acting school, and um, I then carried on acting. I did um, a TV series while I was still 13, and I did a soap, if you like, and I was in it for two years when I was 18, so I was more known in England for that, a thing called Angels, which was about nurses, about student nurses, so I did that for two years when I was 18, and then some more television, theater work, still working, still acting. I now have two children. Um, I have a, quite a successful voiceover career, which is great. And um, I've just recently qualified as a fitness instructor. I continued acting for a while. I did it till I was about 14 or 15. I went to New York University for theater, did some film production, started as a PA, production assistant, worked my way up to second assistant director, and then got a job in Los Angeles at Walt Disney Imagineering, and then started a rollerblade business, and then I started running camera at commercial casting sessions, and started signing autographs as Mike TV. Now I'm not doing any of that anymore. <laughs> I've just accepted a position at Solomon Smith Barney, and I'm gonna be a financial consultant. Well, you know, it wasn't a success when it came out. And uh, I heard some talk about mothers who thought it was cruel to the children. What, what they and everyone else found out later on was that maybe some mothers felt that way, but the children didn't feel that way. The children understood the movie very well. 
that there are limits and they want to know the limits and it's reassuring to know that someone can tell you what the limits are and that's what Willy Wonka did. We all, as parents, we all hope to train our kids or teach our kids and then when they're not in our immediate surroundings, when they're on their own and put in difficult, a difficult situation as Charlie was at the end, you hope as a parent that, that, that your child makes the correct decision. Charlie made the correct decision and that's why I think parents really like this film. It's amazing to me that people are talking to me and say, well, as I was a child, I used to see the film and now I show it to my kids. That's really amazing because it's, it's timeless. And I suppose it is the fantasy. It's everybody's little dream, really, of going to this wonderful, magical place and winning it. You know, I suppose it's a bit like it's the children's version of winning the lottery. I really didn't think that this was going to have the staying power that it has ended up having. Um, of course, I'm thrilled that it does. Um, but I, I didn't think it was going to be all that it is. Since the script operates on two levels, since it's a child's movie and yet, if you're an adult, it also operates on that second level for, for adults or all those jokes, you know. Rachmaninoff, no, it's Mozart, that's an adult joke. That's what we want in life. We want to be that boy. We want to be Charlie who finds a golden ticket. We want to win at the end, but nicely. I hold this movie dear in my career path because it was my first opportunity to touch a movie, a real movie, a real screenplay. It's not really mine. It's Roald Dahl's. I did some patchwork on it. So I see it as, as a thrilling event for a kid coming into this business and, a, and a, a baptism by fire, the hardest, most fraught, frightening work I've probably ever had to do in my life because I had no clue how to accomplish what I promised I could. The fact that the movie has held up over time, has become more popular over time, is uh, very gratifying. I never expected anyone to know I had anything to do with it. That wasn't the deal. Picture comes out, and of course, Quaker Oats puts the candy bar out. The reason for the whole reason for the picture. Out comes the candy bar, out comes the picture. Big promotional campaign, only one problem. The candy bar had a problem in the formula, in the candy bar, and it melted in the, in the stores. I had to withdraw the candy bar. Here, the picture's out no candy bar, fade out. There's no Wonka candy bar that's famous, but the movie became famous. I think that's the payoff of the whole thing. The reason for the movie was to make a candy bar that's last forever. The candy bar didn't last too long, and the movie lasted forever. When I made this picture 30 years ago, I had no idea what its staying power would be. You always make a movie, you hope it's going to be good, great, whatever you want, but you never know what's going to happen to it. I think one reason why there's a longevity to this picture in people's minds is because it was made for adults. It was not made for children. I was not making a Disney picture. I was making a picture for adults because it's my strong feeling that children are very bright, they're very smart, they're very hip, and they will get all the references in the picture. If you had any idea of how many people stopped me about Willy Wonka, you'd be surprised. I mean, you're thinking a lot, but it's more than a lot. The mothers come up to me. Two days ago, a mother came up to me. Could I, this is in our, in our country market, could I um, tell the children who you are? I said, if you don't say it loudly, you can. And she did and whispered, that's Willy Wonka. And, uh, and she smiled at me and she said, what a legacy. Well, it is. That part warms my heart. It is a great legacy. There is no life I know to compare with pure imagination living there you'll be free